On the show today, what's happening with the West Tigers? Where can Jared Hayne improve? And we'll preview Australia's ODI series with England. Stick around for all that and more. This is the Armchair Experts. and welcome to the very first episode of the Armchair Experts and thank you so much for joining us. My name's Daniel Jeffrey. alongside me, Jordan Matthews, and together we'll be taking you through all the week's biggest sporting talking points. That's right, we'll look at some of the controversial decisions to rest players in the last week of the AFL, as well as turning our attention to EPL deadline day and having a bit of a look at what happened there. But first, we'll have a look at the biggest sports news of the week and we'll start with the latest from Flushing Meadows. Aussies Bernard, Tomic and Leighton Hewitt will meet in round two of the US Open after both recorded strong first round wins. It will be the first time the pair clash in their career in what Hewitt described as an awkward encounter. Fellow Aussie Thanasi Kokonaka struggled in the heat, retiring after severe cramping, while Nick Kyrgios was outclassed by third seed Andy Murray. Sam Stozer led the Aussie women, cruising through to the second round in straight sets. To AFL now, and following Fremantle's controversial decision to rest almost half of their full-strength side this weekend, North Melbourne have followed suit, making their intentions clear to rest players against Richmond. The Dockers have already guaranteed the minor premiership, while the Kangaroos will likely finish eighth, ensuring they meet Richmond again in the first week of the finals. The Australian women's cricket team achieved what their male counterparts could not, defeating England in the second 2020 match of their Ashes series. After winning their standalone test match, the Southern Stars needed to win just one of the three 2020 matches, a feat which they achieved last Friday. Despite England picking up a consolation win on Monday in the last game of the series, the Southern Stars returned home with the Ashes. The Australian men's cricket team, however, continued their miserable Ashes tour, losing their standalone 2020 match against England on Monday. A blistering 90 from captain Steve Smith had Australia in prime position, chasing England's 182, but his wicket sparked a collapse, which saw them slump to a five-run loss. The Aussies have a chance to redeem themselves in the five-match ODI series starting tonight. Another disappointing result for the men over in England. And um, look, Jordan, let's get straight into this ODI series. Can a win in the series redeem this tour? Look, in short, no, I don't think it does. I think it feels like we're in mourning a bit. It's like we've lost Michael Clark and Chris Rogers, two influential players in our test team. I think it's like the end of an era. It almost feels like it's the end of an era. Um, I think in short, no, it doesn't, because it does give it a silver lining. If we play well and, and we win the ODI series, it gives us a silver lining, but it's not going to take away from the dismal performance in the Ashes. We would never have expected to lose 3-2. And, you know, even though two test matches we played well, it's not going to take away from the fact that we lost the Ashes. So, no. You're absolutely right, I reckon. Um, the one thing I will say, though, is I reckon it can be a bit of a platform for this young team going forward, particularly Steve Smith. Get a good win here, it gives him confidence going into the Bangladesh and New Zealand tours. Dave Warner, same thing, with him now stepping up as vice-captain of the sides. It'd be great to see him have a big series. Then also looking at the young guys who are about to come into the test side. Joe Burns, good performance, suddenly he's knocking on the door, banging on the door, get me into this test side. Pat Cummins as well. I'd be absolutely shocked if we don't see him pulling on the baggy green again in the next six months or so. Really important for him to have a good series here. Can give him a nice platform going into these next series. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess if we're looking at key players, who do you think? Who have you got for your key players? One from either team. Yeah, so for me, I got Ben Stokes for England. I, I just love watching this guy play cricket, and he, he makes important contributions. He makes big runs, takes big wickets. He's great in the field. I mean, you know, there, he's just an all-round cricketer. There aren't many guys in this English side that I say look and say, gee, I'd love to see him playing in green and gold. He's number one on my list, though. For Australia, I've got another all-rounder, Glenn Maxwell. Reckon with James Faulkner being out, we're really going to need Maxwell to step up, use his versatility. His spin bowling has come along in leaps and bounds since he came into the team. And his batting, we all know how dangerous that can be. He can win you a game in five overs. He's that good. Yeah, definitely. And look, I've gone for a couple of match winners as well. Dave Warner, for me, at the top of the, inning, at the, top of the innings, you want a good start in an ODI game. And they're opening bats to the guys that can really take a game away from the other team. 
Dave Warner can do that. He's at the point of his career now where he does need to start making more consistent runs in, in international cricket, one day international cricket especially. So, look, I think it's his time to shine. He has stepped up into that leadership role now. So, I'd love to see him have a really good series. I think he is probably Australia's key player. And a guy from England who I tipped to have a massive World Cup and he didn't, he didn't perform. And I think it probably went a long way to England not having a great uh, campaign. Owen Morgan, the captain, classy international player, hasn't played a lot of test cricket, but in the limited overs form, he's, he's brilliant. He works the ball around well. He can play big strokes, he finds gaps. Very good bat. I think he'll probably have a big series and he played really well in the T20 the other night. So hopefully we see him make some runs, but. Yeah, you got a tip. England being England, there's gonna be a washout, but 3-1 to Australia. I think overall their, their, their squad's better. Uh, with England, you know, They've lost, Jimmy Anderson's retired from international cricket, uh, from ODI cricket, Stuart Broad's not playing, and Joe Root's not playing. So I think, at the moment, I'm going to go Australia 3-1. I think they'll be too strong. Yeah, I think both weakened sides, you know, mentioned the guys England have got out. We're missing, you know, Australia are missing Mitch jo Johnson and Josh Hazelwood. I got the Aussies going up, though, as well. I reckon in Mitch Stark, we got one of the best bowlers in the world. Probably the best one-day bowler in the world, really. I reckon we'll be go too good for them, 4-1 for Australia. So obviously the men couldn't take the Ashes home from England, but that was something the Southern Stars managed pretty comfortably. Now on Monday night, Channel 9 broadcast the final Ashes T20 match between Australia and England. And that had us wondering, with the Southern Stars success, should we be seeing more women's sport on free-to-air TV? We hit the campus corner to find out what everyone thinks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was watching a women's 2020 match the other night, actually, and when the Women's World Cup was on, I watched a few games of that, so absolutely. You know, they've worked just as hard as a lot of the male athletes have, and they deserve as much, you know, broadcast time, game time as the men do. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yes, because women work just as hard as men, and they don't get paid as much or get as much credit for what they do. I know the netball was just on recently, but I think there needs to be more sort of like, it needs to be broadcast a lot more to a wider audience. They've got niche sta like stations that will broadcast it, but it needs to be more widespread, I think. Yeah, I think so. I, there's not much around, so I, unfortunately I do find women's sport a bit boring. <laughs> So pretty clear consensus there, everyone wants to see more women's sport on television and I guess that's something that we hope the free-to-air broadcasters will do in the near future. Yeah, absolutely, especially when you look at the success of teams like the Matildas and of course the Southern Stars, they're doing brilliantly. And now it's that time of the week where we look back at the past seven days and let you guys know what we learnt this past week. So Jordan, what did you learn this week? So not so much what I learnt, Dan, but I have never been so excited for September. I guess spring means finals footy and this year's finals is going to be an absolute cracker. I look at the top eight and how they line up now and how it stacks up and the, the games for the first week of the finals are going to be unbelievable. So you've got Sydney Fremantle, West Coast Hawthorne, uh, Doggies Adelaide and Richmond North. There's not a bad game there. It's going to be brilliant and I cannot wait. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. It's going to be a ripping final series this year. I'm going to look across the codes though and look at the NRL and say what I learnt this week is that my beloved West Tigers, they just need an overhaul and not in the way that they're going about it at the moment. You look there, the front office has been making decisions for a while now that haven't been great. You know, you go back to letting Bryce Gibbs and Chris Hyington go to the Sharks when both players wanted to stay at Leichhardt. Look, Blake Austin going to Canberra at the end of last year, you know, watching him, he'd just oh, it'd break every Tigers fan's heart. Now, they've capped it off by telling Robbie Farrar he's only good enough for reserve grade. I mean, this is a guy that, First name, one of the first names on the New South Wales Origin team sheet. He took a $200,000 pay cut a few years back, according to Benji Marshall. And, you know, he showed on the weekend, he's still a good player. I reckon, you know, i got no idea what the Tigers are doing, but they need to sort themselves out. Look, it's a bit of, a, bit of a kick in the teeth, really, and I guess Benji Marshall hit the nail on the head the other night, saying a guy who's prepared to take a triple-figure pay cut you know, to state your club, 
you got to treat him better than that. Absolutely. Yeah. I reckon my tip, he'll be heading to the Super League. So another thing that we've probably all been learning a bit more about over the last few weeks is that Jared Hayne is a genuine chance to be playing NFL football this year. So this week, Dan went to the whiteboard to break down exactly what Hayne has to do to make it in the NFL. If you haven't heard about Jared Hayne in the past few weeks, you've either been living under a rock or just avoiding Fox Sports Australia's Facebook page. Odds are though, you've probably heard that Haynes made a pretty good start to his new career. And as Aussie sports fans, we're probably not all that surprised. After all, we're used to seeing him do things like this. There's no doubt Hain is a natural athlete. Fact is though, he's still got to work on plenty of things before he can make it in the NFL. Here are a couple of things he needs to improve. As a league player, Haynes' upright running style was perfect allowing him to do things like this. In the NFL though, it's not quite so good. To be an effective running back, Haynes got to learn to get his centre of gravity nice and low so that when he gets hit, he won't lose valuable yardage. Haynes' biggest advantage is when he gets into the open field, where his NRL background makes him lethal. The problem is getting there. Playing at wide receiver probably gives Hain the best chance to get into the open field. Problem is, that requires him to learn the running routes of the position, something that didn't work out too well against Denver. Probably ran that route too wide, too close to the sideline, and really didn't give the quarterback a chance. NFL experts have made it pretty clear that it's going to be difficult for Hain to make an impact outside of special teams. But he's surprised everyone so far. Might be that Hain can get himself running lower and turn himself into a serviceable running back. But for the time being, let's all grab some Vegemite and enjoy his punt returns. Here's Jared Hayne. How about that catch? Say hey. Wow. He does this a couple more times. We're all going to be eating Vegemite up here. For the record, I actually really quite dislike Vegemite. Look, it's not great, but put it on the record here now. If Jared Hayne scores a touchdown this year, I'll eat a whole jar of the stuff. I'm excited. I can't wait to see him playing. I won't. What we'll do though first is we'll look at the Fast Five. So we'll preview this, what's happening this week with five burning questions. And we'll start with Aussie rules. Will this benefit three men on the North, leaving all these players out? Um, I, look, yes. I think for Frio, definitely. You know, uh, the only worry is if they win in the first week, suddenly they go into preliminary final having played only one of the past three weeks. Um, but, you know, that's not half as bad as losing a play to injury. North, so I'm a bit more worried about if they lose, they can end up travelling to Adelaide in the first week of the finals. That's a tough trip to have to make. Definitely. Look, Ross Lyon's done this before. He knows how to do it. North, on the other hand, I'm a bit worried about. They need to be careful what they're doing. Absolutely. So, second question. Socceroos World Cup qualifiers coming up. How much are we going to miss Mila Yednak and Matt Ryan, who are out through injury? Look, we shouldn't. We shouldn't miss them at all, right? I think we're playing Bangladesh. The team we've got at the moment should be able to cover it. I think they'll be bitterly disappointed with anything but a win. So, look, I think they'll be right. They've got blokes coming in who can do the job. Yeah, absolutely. You, look, Luke Bratton's a quality passer. He'll be able to cover Yednak fine. Galekovic is a quality goalkeeper. He's been the best in the A-League for a long time. Probably the best since Matt Ryan left. Um, will be fine, especially considering the quality of guys we're playing. Okay, so the third one, who got the best out of EPL deadline day? I'm going to say Everton. I reckon keeping hold of John Stones, like he's a quality young defender. If they can keep him um, on Merseyside for a lot longer, they've got a great young player, great defender. You know. And they also picked up Aaron Lennon, who's a quality player, proven in the EPL. I reckon they did a good bit of business. Yeah, look, I think the Hammers... They were easily the most active on, on deadline day. Um, they've, they've signed Victor Moses on loan, Alex Song on loan, and Jelovic, who is a proven goal scorer in the EPL. So look, they've done pretty well for themselves, and it's only going to hold them in, in good stead for the rest of the year. Okay, so question number four. Should Collingwood trade Travis Cloak? Short answer, no. They've got 21-year-old Darcy Moore there at the moment, who is not ready to play AFL football yet, but he's shown that he will be a gun. So. You keep Cloak now, you can build towards, you know, three years down the track, four years down the track maybe. When Collingwood's list has matured, you've got between 50 and 100 games under most of their belts. They're at, they're at a, a, a point where they can win a premiership and you've got two key forwards. Collingwood have been searching for that duo to win a premiership for a long time and I think 
the only way they're going to do it is by keeping more and cloak. Yeah, I disagree with you on this one. I reckon they should trade him, you know, while he's got currency. You look at the face of it, yes, he's a great mark, but ultimately Cloak is a key forward that can't kick straight. I reckon trade him now while he's still got some currency, get a good young player for him, start rebuilding. Fair, okay. Question five, can Nick Young play for the Boomers? No, <laughs> absolutely not. If you're unsure about what we're talking about, Nick Young's been posting on Twitter how he'd like to play for Australia. Ultimately, to play for the Boomers, he needs to be an Australian citizen. To be an Australian citizen, he needs to actually live in Australia, which he doesn't do because he's playing in the NBA. So unless he stops playing in the NBA, which I don't think even he's crazy enough to no. stop doing, he's not going to be wearing green he's, gold. he's a bit of a clown, but I don't think he's that stupid. And I think this is just a massive stitch up, so don't read too much into it. It's good fun though. Good fun. Quality. <laughs> All right, guys, so just before we go, we've got a couple of suggestions on things we should we think you should check out this week. So for me, Fox Footy aired a two-part series the other day on Daniel Menzel. And for anyone who doesn't know his, his story, this guy is a 23-year-old who's played AFL. He's played about 27 games of AFL football, and he's had four knee reconstructions. He's probably the most inspirational bloke going around. His story is unbelievable, and he's just fought back from... You know, one knee reconstruction is that you're out for 12 months. Two, your career's pretty much over. This bloke's had four. So, two-part documentary series. Definitely check it out. It's worth a look. Yeah, Menzel's story is a great one. Um, you know, great to see him come back into the AFL with four goals. Yeah, last week was brilliant. I think anyone watching the footy last week, whether you're a Pies supporter or a Geelong supporter, or just... Would have been happy to see it. Yeah, it was really amazing. Me, I'm got, if you're after something a little bit lighter, I've gone for a pretty amusing Bleacher Report article that sums up the farce that was David De Gea's failed transfer from Manchester to Real Madrid. Um, some of Twitter's reaction to this thing was absolutely golden. So if you're after something a bit lighter, check it out. Chuck the link in the description. Well, unfortunately, guys, that's all we've got time for this week. So make sure you keep up with us on Facebook and Twitter at The Armchair Experts. And also subscribe to UAW TV to check out all the latest episodes. Yeah, that's right. We'll be back next Thursday with another episode. But until then, grab yourselves a good armchair to check out all the week's sporting action. And we'll be back next Thursday to break it all down for you. We'll see you then.